The Last of the Plainsmen by Zane Gray. Chapter 8 Naza, Naza, Naza. It was a waiting day at Fort Chippewyan. The lonesome far northern Hudson Bay trading post seldom saw such life. Teepees dotted the banks of the Slave River, and lines of blanketed Indians paraded its shores. Near the boat landing, a group of chiefs, grotesque in semi-barbaric, semi-civilized splendor, but black-browed, austere-eyed, stood in savage dignity with folded arms and high-held heads. Lounging on the grassy bank were white men, traders, trappers, and officials of the post. All eyes were on the distant curve of the river, where, as it lost itself in a fine French bend of dark green, white glinting waves danced and fluttered. A June sky lay blue in the majestic stream, ragged spear-topped, dense green trees massed down to the water. Beyond rose bold, bald-knobbed hills in remote purple relief. Long Indian arms stretched south. The waiting eyes discerned a black speck on the green and watched it grow. A flatboat, with a man standing to the oars, bore down swiftly. Not a red hand, nor a white one, offered to help the voyager in the difficult landing. The oblong, clumsy, heavily laden boat surged in with the current and passed the dock despite the boatman's efforts. He swung his craft in below upon a bar and roped it fast to a tree. The Indians crowded above him on the bank. The boatman raised his powerful form erect, lifted a bronze face, which seemed set in craggy hardness, and cast from narrow eyes a keen, cool glance on those above. The silvery gleam in his hair told of years. Silence, impressive as it was ominous, broke only to the rattle of camping paraphernalia, which the voyager threw to a level grassy bench on the bank. Evidently this unwelcome visitor had journeyed from afar, and his boat sunk deep into the water with its load of barrels, boxes, and bags, indicated that the journey had only begun. Significant, too, were a couple of long Winchester rifles shining on a tarpaulin. The cold-faced crowd stirred and parted to permit the passage of a tall, thin, gray personage of official bearing in a faded military coat. "'Are you the muskox hunter?' he asked in tones that contained no welcome. The boatman greeted this peremptory interlocutor with a cool laugh, a strange laugh, in which the muscles of his face appeared not to play. "'Yes, I am that man,' he said. "'The chiefs of the Chippewayan and great slave tribes have been apprised of your coming. They have held counsel and are here to speak with you.' At a motion from the commandant, the line of chieftains, piled down to the level bench, and formed a half-circle before the voyager. To a man who had stood before grim Sitting Bull and noble Black Thunder of the Sioux, and faced the falcon-eyed Geronimo, and glanced over the sights of a rifle at gorgeous, feathered, wild, free Comanches, this semicircle of savages, lords of the north, was a sorry comparison. Bedobbled and betrinketed, slouchy and slovenly, these low-statured chiefs belied in appearance their scorn-bright eyes and lofty mane. They made a sad group. One who spoke in unintelligible language rolled out a haughty, sonorous voice over the listening multitude. When he had finished, a half-breed interpreter, in the dress of a white man, spoke at a signal from the commandant. He says, listen to the great orator of the Chippewayan. He has summoned all the chiefs of the tribes south of Great Slave Lake. He has held counsel. The cunning of the pale-face, who comes to take the musk oxen, is well known. Let the pale-face hunter return to his own hunting grounds. Let him turn his face from the north. Never will the chiefs permit the white man to take musk oxen alive from their country. The agateer, the musk ox, is their god. He gives them food and fur. He will never come back if he is taken away, and the reindeer will follow him. The chiefs and their people would starve. They command the pale-faced hunter to go back. They cry, Naza, Naza, Naza. Say, for a thousand miles I've heard that word, Naza, returned the hunter, with mingled curiosity and disgust. At Edmonton, Indian runners started ahead of me, and every village I struck, the redskins would crowd around me, and an old chief would harangue at me and motion me back and point north with Naza, Naza, Naza. What does it mean? No white man knows. No Indian will tell, answered the interpreter. 
The traders think it means the great slave, the North Star, the North Spirit, the North Wind, the North Lights, and Agatir, the musk ox god. Well, say to the chiefs, to tell Agatir I have been four moons on the way after some of his little Agatirs, and I'm going to keep on after them. Hunter, you, you are most unwise, broke in the commandant in his officious voice. The Indians will never permit you to take a musk ox alive from the north. They worship him, pray to him. It is a wonder you have not been stopped. Who will stop me? The Indians. They will kill you if you do not turn back. Fah! To tell an American plainsman that. The hunter paused a steady moment with his eyelids narrowing over slits of blue fire. There is no law to keep me out. Nothing but Indian superstition and the greed of the Hudson Bay people. And I am an old fox, not to be fooled by petty baits. For years the officer of this fur-trading company have tried to keep out explorers. Even Sir John Franklin, an Englishman, could not buy food of them. The policy of the company is to side with the Indians, to keep the out traders and trappers. Why? so they can keep on cheating the poor savages out of clothing and food by trading a few trinkets and blankets, a little tobacco and rum, for millions of dollars' worth of furs. Have I failed to hire a man after man, Indian after Indian, not to know why I cannot get a helper? Have I, a plainsman, come a thousand miles alone to be scared by you, or a lot of craven Indians? Have I been dreaming of musk oxen for forty years to slink south now? When I begin to feel the North, not I. Deliberately, every chief, with the sound of a hissing snake, spat in the hunter's face. He stood immovable while they perpetrated the outrage, then calmly wiped his cheeks, and in his strange, cool voice addressed the interpreter. Tell them thus they show their true qualities to insult in council. Tell them they are not chiefs, but dogs. Tell them they are not even squaws, only poor, miserable, starved dogs. Tell them I turn my back on them. Tell them the pale faces fought real chiefs, fierce, bold, like eagles, and he turns his back on dogs. Tell them he is the one who could teach them to raise the muskox and the reindeer, and to keep out the cold and the wolf. But they are blinded. Tell them the hunter goes north. Through the council of chiefs ran a low mutter, as of gathering thunder. True to his word, the hunter turned his back on them. As he brushed by, his eye caught a gaunt savage slipping from the boat. At the hunter's stern call, the Indian leaped ashore, and started to run. He had stolen a parcel. He would have succeeded in eluding its owner, but for an unforeseen obstacle, as striking as it was unexpected. A white man of colossal stature had stepped in the chief's passage, and laid two great hands on him. Instantly the parcel flew from the Indian, and he spun in the air to fall into the river with a sounding splash. Yells signaled the surprise and alarm caused by this unexpected incident. The Indian frantically swam to the shore, whereupon the champion of the stranger in a strange land lifted a bag, which gave forth a musical clink of steel, and throwing it with the camp articles on the grassy bench. He extended a huge, friendly hand. "'My name is Rhea,' he said in a deep, cavernous tones. "'Mine is Jones,' replied the hunter, and right quickly did he grasp a proliferate hand. He saw in Rhea a giant, of whom he was but a stunted shadow, six and a half feet. Rhea stood, with yard-wide shoulders, a bulk of bone and brawn. His ponderous, shaggy head rested on a bull neck. His broad face, with its low forehead, its close-shut mastiff under jaw, its big opaque eyes, pale and cruel as those of a jaguar, marked him a man of terrible brute force. "'Free trader,' called the commandant. "'Better think twice before you join fortunes with the musk-ox hunter.' "'To hell with you and your rantin', dog-eared redskins,' cried Rhea. I've run again a man of my own kind, a man of my own country, and I'm going with him. With this he thrust aside some encroaching, gaping Indians, so unconcernedly and ungently that they sprawled upon the grass. 
Slowly the crowd mounted and once more lined the bank. Jones realized that by some late turning stroke of fortune he had fallen in with one of the few free traders of the province. These free traders, from the very nature of their calling, which was to defy the fur company and to trap and trade on their own account, were a hardy and intrepid class of men. Ray's worth to Jones exceeded that of a dozen ordinary men. He knew the ways of the North, the language of the tribes, the habits of the animals, the handling of dogs, and uses of food and fuel. Moreover, it soon appeared that he was a carpenter and blacksmith. "'There, my kit,' he said, dumping the contents of his bag. It consisted of a bunch of steel traps, some tools, a broken axe, a box of miscellaneous things such as trappers use, and a few articles of flannel. "'Thieving redskins,' he added in explanation of his poverty. "'Not much of an outfit, but I'm the man for you. Besides, I had a pal once to knew you on the plains, called you Buff, Jones.' Old Jim Brent he was. I recollect Jim, said Jones. He went down in Custer's last charge. So you were Jim's pal. That'd be a recommendation, if you needed one. But the way you chucked that Indian overboard got me. Ray soon manifested himself as a man of few words and much action. With the planks Jones had on board, he heightened the stern and bow of the boat to keep out the beating waves in the rapids. He fashioned a steering gear and a less awkward set of oars, and shifted the cargo so as to make more room in the craft. Buff, we're in for a storm. Set up a tarpaulin and make a fire. We'll pretend to camp tonight. Those Indians won't dream we'd try to run the river after dark, and we'll slip by under cover. The sun glazed over, clouds moved up from the north, a cold wind swept the tips of the spruces, and rain commenced to drive in gusts. By the time it was dark, not an Indian showed himself. They were housed from the storm. Lights twinkled in the tepees and the big log cabins of the trading company. Jones scouted round till pitchy black night. Then a freezing, pouring blast sent him back to the protection of the tarpaulin. When he got there, he found that Ray had taken it down and awaited him. Off, said the free trader, and with no more noise than a drifting feather, the boat sprung into the current and glided down till the twinkling fires no longer accentuated the darkness. By night the river, in common with all swift rivers, had a sullen voice, and murmured its hurry, its restraint, its menace, its meaning. The two boatmen, one at the steering gear, one at the oars, faced the pelting rain and watched the dim, dark line of trees. The craft slid noiselessly onward into the gloom and into Jones's ears above the storm poured another sound, a steady, muffled rumble, like the roll of giant chariot wheels. It had come to be a familiar roar to him, and the only thing which in his long life of hazard had ever sent the cold, prickling, tight shudder over his warm skin. Many times on the Abysbaca that rumble had prestaged the dangerous and dreaded rapids. "'Hell, Ben Rapids!' shouted Ray. Bad water, but no rocks. The rumble expanded to a roar, the roar to a boom, that charged the air with heaviness, with a dreamy burr. The whole indistinct world appeared to be moving to the lash of wind, to the sound of rain, to the roar of the river. The boat shot down and sailed aloft, met shock on shock, breasted leaping dim white waves, and in a hollow, unearthly blend of watery sounds, rode on and on buffeted, tossed, pitched into a black chaos, and yet gleamed with the obscure shrouds of light. Then the convulsive stream shrieked out a last defiance, changed its course abruptly to slow down and drown the sound of rapids in muffling distance. Once more the craft swept on smoothly to the drive of the wind and rush of the rain. By midnight the storm cleared. Murky clouds split to show shiny blue-white stars, and a fitful moon that silvered the crests of the truces and sometimes hid like a gleaming black-threaded pearl behind the dark branches. Jones, a plainsman, all his days wonderingly watched the moon-blanched water. He saw it shade and darken under shadowy walls of granite where it swelled with hollow song and gurgle. He heard again the far-off rumble. Faint on the night wind, high cliff banks appeared, walled out the mellow light, and the river suddenly narrowed yawning holes, whirlpools of a second, opened with a gurgling suck, and raced with the boat. On the craft flew, 
Far ahead, a long, declining plain of jumping, frosted waves played dark and white with the moonbeams. The slave plunged to his freedom, down his river, stone-spiked bed, knowing no patient eddy, and white wreathed his dark, shiny rocks in spume and spray. End of chapter 8